Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. You know, we're never scripted, but we're really unscripted tonight. We are rolling with it. <laughs> we are just rolling with it. <laughs> we're just going to so, roll Just it. so y'all know, we have a topic, and we have a cocktail. We do. And in both cases, we're sort of just making it up as we go. We're winging it. We're winging it. <laughs> Lucky y'all. <laughs> Lucky y'all. And we're so glad that you're grateful fans of That's ours. Right. That you are just thrilled to hear us coming to you with jingling bracelets or without, <laughs> with dogs barking or without, with something to say. No, we never come without something to That's say. That's true. We always have stuff to talk about. Well, today, before I tell you what we're talking about, I'm going to tell you what we're drinking. <laughs> we are drinking another yummy cocktail from our Cocktail Theology cocktail book. If you would like a digital copy of your very own, reach out to us and let's talk about it. You can always email us. Uh, I always give you the email address at the end, but I'll give it to you at the beginning. How about that? We're just going to shake things up. It's Ooh, crazy. Tell you, we're just running. It's E-L-A-N-E, Elaine, at schoolforseekers.com, or Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N, at schoolforseekers.com. Also, by the way, if you aren't on our mailing list, you really should get on our mailing list. Absolutely. Uh, because that's where we send out emails that tell you all about the cool things we're doing, including like, like courses, courses and stuff. Yeah. And, and concerts, and in concerts. your case, and yeah. live and recordings stuff. of this. Yes, by all means, go sign up. Now, I'm done with all that. We are drinking Autumn in Manhattan. This cocktail is rye based mm-hmm. so it has rye whiskey in it and we chose the george dickel rye which is one of our very favorites i really like the dickel rye and you definitely can't beat it for the price it also has dolan rouge which is our favorite sweet vermouth mm-hmm. most of the time for mm-hmm. most things mm-hmm. and uh, it has aromatic bitters and it has uh, a brown sugar syrup which is brown sugar and water equal proportions heated until the sugar melts Pretty easy to make. Pretty easy to make. Yeah. And then it has a look sort of cherry. Really, really yummy. It's really, really yummy, yeah. While we enjoy this yummy cocktail, what we're going to be discussing today in our series on reclaiming language is the word flesh. And if, like me, uh, you were reared in a church that talked about the flesh a lot. Flesh. The flesh. What I walked away with was the flesh was bad, bad, bad news. And you mean by flesh what when you say that? Uh, well, usually when it was used in a sermon or, you know, the King James Bible, mm. the way that it was interpreted uh, in my little church, it usually meant uh, sexual desire or oh, God. sex. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, or, sorry, sorry. Um, I'll be quiet now. Or <laughs> and, 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 and that's why we're going to reclaim it, because it's not actually about that at all. But seemed like every sermon I ever heard on the flesh had to do with things you ought not be doing uh, with your body. And a lot of it comes back to like a sinful nature within us, like a fleshly proclivity to do these horrible things, because with the doctrine of original sin, if, uh, if you believe that, and I hope you don't, then we are all, you know, horrible worms. And so it is in our nature to be horrible worms, and flesh ties into all that. So... That's that's what we're talking about. <laughs> that's what we're talking about today. Wow. And so so for those of you who can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> the, the grimace so, and the and the wrenching. The grimace great. and the wrenching and the, the throwing my face into my hands right now. I'm looking up scripture because I don't want to say a lie that I know is a lie. So hang on just a moment. Anyway, here's what I think is going on with that. Okay. I think that Setting aside the deliberate misuse of scripture, Mm -hmm. setting that aside for the moment, I think we can blame this on the Greeks. On the Greeks? Why? On the Greeks. Because in in Greco thinking, particularly just before Jesus, but going into Jesus' time, there's a huge binary. Now, Aristotle kind of solved that, but, but just in general, the Greeks brought us a kind of binary that was not present in Hebrew literature, Hebrew ways of thinking. Mm. So the Greeks brought us things like flesh versus spirit, yeah. black versus white. That, mm. like, that kind of way of thinking about things is very, very Greek, or at least was at that point. Okay. 
in this case, as in many, we've absorbed this Greek binary. To be clear, I'm not saying that the Greeks of modern Greece think <laughs> this way. Okay, I am talking about I'm talking about the literature and the culture of those times. Yes. Okay, the way people intellectualize the world, and there was at that time some some binary that had not been present for the Hebrew people who were in Greek locations under Roman rule. Now, again, lots of lots of caveats around that. Yes, that was Latin. <laughs> um, but lots of caveats not around Greek. not Greek. <laughs> lots of caveats around that, but but a lot of the binary we come up with mm-hmm. comes from the Greeks. Now they did not hear it the way we do. But that flesh versus spirit is part of the way that they made sense of the physical and non-physical world. Uh, And again, it did not, for the Greeks, have as much weight on it. But if you take looking at Jesus and looking at Hebrew scripture and you funnel it through Greco-Roman ways of thinking, you can really torture it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so you wind up with this this division between physical flesh, like this, this stuff that we are made of, mm-hmm. and spirit, anything that isn't this, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody breathe. I would like you to just sit in your bodies for the moment, breathe deeply. And say to yourself, my body is not a bad thing. That's really important. It is really because, important. Because the way it's interpreted is the idea that bodies are bad. Right. Spirit is good, whatever spirit means. Body's bad. So anything that is of the body is bad. Anything that is of the spirit is good. Which gets more twisted when you have this deep feeling that maybe only some bodies are bad and only some desires are bad and you're trying to deal with your own shame and your own confusion all of that Mm -hmm. we wind up with this really bizarre notion of flesh versus anyway it it just it it doesn't work yeah (sighs) so in the christian scriptures i'm not going to go into this for a long time but basically you've got a couple of different words in there one of them is soma, which is just the actual literal stuff that is attached to your bone, right? Mm-hmm. Like the physical stuff. Mm-hmm. The other word is not that, and it's not going to come to my mind right now, but listeners, if you know it, by all means, send it in. But it's, it's the idea of unthoughtful impulses. Okay. Okay? I don't want to say desires because it's not exactly what it's about. Yeah. But it's kind of like if you take our, our most animalistic impulses... Mm-hmm. That's what flesh means. Ah. It would also include things like slapping somebody upside the head because they said something mm. you don't like. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. would include, I don't know, being mean. To, I don't know. All kind of our things. automatic reactions. Um, but particularly if there's something you would see in animals. Ah, uh, okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so if I have the automatic reaction to hug you, that's not flesh, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. But if I have the automatic reaction to think you're an idiot... That's flesh, even though it doesn't involve my body. Yeah, okay. Okay? All that to say is all of that is going on in the Christian scriptures. But as we talked about in the episode on abomination, the way we have been taught to think about ourselves, particularly if we're from a minority group, whatever that may be, we start to think of ourselves as being this naturally negative thing. And right. so flesh becomes almost anything we are. Mm. And then the people who would use this to keep us quiet, to keep us docile, to keep us feeling like we're not worthy, to keep us trying to become them, use that. Mm-hmm. Now, I am of the opinion that the people who use it to push other people down also are grappling in themselves. Right. I, don't, I don't think that culture is that segregated in that sense. But it becomes this weight that is an, literally weight. Mm-hmm. So if you're the kind of person who grows up with body image stuff, 
it becomes weight. Flesh is bad, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes this weight that we all carry around that says, hey, the basic impulses of bodies are bad, period. Right, which is... A little screwy. A little screwy. And for those of us who have had eating disorders, I'm raising my hand, I don't know who else is, or who have had other understandings of their bodies as being particularly bad in themselves, even if nothing else happens. So that basic self-care or basic connection feels shameful or wrong or taking up too much space. Mm. All of that starts to inform that Absolutely. way of thinking about flesh. Absolutely. Right. Right. And as you're talking about this, and I, I mentioned original sin in passing earlier, but but then when you add in the idea of original sin and that we are created with a sinful uh, nature that has to be rescued, redeemed, made right, then... Whitened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's not just your fleshly body, but it's everything yes. about you. It's every thought. It's every urge. It's yes. v- it's every right. doubt or fear or question or any of that stuff. Right. It all gets filed in this drawer called flesh that's Absolutely. so bad. It's horrible. Yeah. It, it is such an encompassing idea. It affects those who use it that way, too. So, what can happen when we are dividing ourselves into spirit and flesh, into good and bad, into thinking and feeling, into all of these things? What happens is we take all of those parts of ourselves that we think are shameful or that God doesn't love, all of those things, and we put them in a little package and we go and visit them in the dark. Yeah. So many of the pastors, politicians, people who have been caught out doing something that they preached against or spoke against, what's happening is they're so divided within themselves mm-hmm. that they can't, that, like, they don't, they can't, to, to acknowledge that flesh is part of being who we are, and I'm talking again about, yeah, yeah. Nor, you know, right. is excruciating. Mm-hmm. And so they act out. Mm-hmm. We act out in all these ways. And because we're acting out in the shadows and in the dark, we have to be very loud in the world. Right, right, right. right. The truly destructive part of all of this is it isn't just like, that person over there feels this way. It's not just, you know, the woman who's starving herself to death, right? It's not just the gay man who never has sex and thinks he never will, right? It's not mm-hmm. just that. It's mm-hmm. the, the, this division that we create within ourselves and nurture within ourselves destroys us and it destroys everyone around us. Yeah. Yeah, it really, really does. I might be a little passionate about this. No, it's it's really... It's so insidious in the way that yes. that we are often taught in church, and as if the messaging we're getting from secular media isn't bad enough, right. that we aren't good enough, or that we aren't pretty enough, or thin enough, or whatever. Then you you add this element of God is disappointed in your flesh. Absolutely. Then then where where's the where's the hope in that? Yeah, and and God made us physical creatures. God became a physical creature. Mm -hmm. God is within and throughout and lighting up the physical creation. God is not afraid of physicality. No, no, no. Right? Where the Greeks come back in, and this is, I think, useful, is that the Greeks divided what was eternal from what was not eternal, which is fine. But what was eternal was pinnacle of good. Mm-hmm. What was not eternal was not the pinnacle of good. Mm-hmm. Which then, when you throw Christianity at it, then what you get is anything eternal 
is the pinnacle of good, which means God is the pinnacle of good, but also hates, Mm. because we use that hate word in such the wrong way, hates the non-eternal. And we are both non-eternal and eternal. Right. And so we do everything we can to get rid of the non-eternal part as if God's making that was somehow a mistake. Because, you know, God isn't really in control of God's self and must have just accidentally <laughs> done it. I mean, I, I don't know how to go I don't, theologically I don't know with how, this, Yeah, right? I can't connect those dots either. But that's it. And it's just not true. It's just not true. We are creatures and beloved creatures and treasured creatures and enjoyed creatures and God came to us as a creature at least once. Mm-hmm. So we know that at least once <laughs> God said, well, this could be fun. <laughs> right. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, it is And it amazing. should help us reclaim these bodies as potentially gorgeous. Yeah. Listeners, what do you guys think? How have you perceived that word flesh from a uh, biblical standpoint? If, like me, you heard your pastor read from um, the King James Version, the old, old one, and he used flesh in uh, in a way that, that made you feel like pretty much everything about you, especially the sexual parts, were dirty and wrong. Can we just go to the King James at some point and just do a whole episode on the King James? Oh, we'll totally do that. Okay. Writing that down for season Thank four. Thank you. All right. Yes. We would love to hear from you. I gave you the email addresses at the beginning, so I won't bore you with them again. We love, love, love hearing from you guys. Have a great one. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.